The Windows Task Manager may not be the best code that I've ever written, but it was the best that I could do 30 years ago, and I think it's more than withstood the test of time. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and I'm the original author of the Windows Task Manager. Today, we're going to take a detailed look at both the original creation of the Windows Task Manager and then go over some insider secrets that I've baked into the mix. I wrote the first drafts of Task Manager in my den at home and then took the resultant program into work. Back in those days, we followed a practice known as eating our own dog food, which meant that we self-hosted on the newest daily builds of Windows NT, even as we worked to create them. Eventually, a number of other developers talked me into giving them copies of my Task Manager, and it spread amongst the team. It eventually came to the notice of Dave Cutler, the designer of Windows NT, and second at the company, perhaps only to Bill Gates, as far as we were concerned. Fortunately, he was a big fan of the fledging Task Manager and gave me permission to add it to the main Windows source tree. Once I had put it into the product, a senior developer named Mark Lukowski was essential at keeping it there. He served as its occasional champion, fending off the complaints from the designers of Windows 95 who found the whole thing overly technical and nerdy in a way that ran contrary to their mission of simplifying the PC experience. Of course, it likely didn't help that Dave C. initially had me put it at the very top of the start menu, which was basically received as a big middle finger by the Windows 95 shell designers. I moved the link to somewhere reasonable, like system tools, and everybody seemed satisfied. No money exchanged hands and no contracts were signed. I simply added it to the project source tree and changed the copyright headers. It was very much a wild west in those days comparison to how you would go about it these days. The best part about it was, at the time, at least from my perspective, was that once I added it to the product, my favorite hobby then became my day job. The software that I had been tinkering with my den now became my primary full-time job for a few months. It'd be very much like if you had a hobby of building little birdhouses and one day you brought them in to show your boss and your boss was like, you know, Dave, we really like your little birdhouses. We're going to pay you to build them here at work for a while. My birdhouses just happen to be Task Manager. When putting a new block of code like Task Manager into the source tree, you can't just stick a piece of shareware into an operating system and call it good, particularly when that code will be somewhat mission critical. There's a huge difference in the required code quality and robustness between an app that you crank out over a weekend and an important part of the Windows operating system. Well, usually there is. It would take a lot of work to bring my early draft up to the standard required for inclusion in the operating system, and that work would be part of my day job for the next couple of months. As you can imagine, when it comes to an app like Task Manager, the accuracy of the data that it's reporting is paramount, and early in its development, I was chasing an annoying bug related to total CPU usage. It was all calculated very precisely for each process based on the system accounting, but when they were added up individually, very, very rarely, it would briefly show a total greater than 100%. I stared at my code until I could barely see straight, but I just could not find the problem. I convinced myself that the problem had to be the kernel's accounting, but blaming the kernel is almost akin to claiming, oh, it must be a compiler bug, when you really don't understand what your own code is doing. The bar for blaming the kernel guys was very, very high, and I did try, but they were unmoved. They were pretty certain it had to be my problem. In order to try to catch this weird edge case, I placed an assertion in the code. Now, an assertion is a statement which verifies that a particular condition is always true, and I added one to continually check and validate on every machine everywhere that the total was less than 100% or equal to. It would also recheck that total once per second. My assertion would trigger if the total was ever more than 100%. The plan was to run this through the entire gauntlet of nightly NT stress tests across the team. What's an NT stress test? Well, each and every night, every developer before they left would start a test suite to put their PC to work running the day's latest test build of Windows under enormous loads. It would call every API and do everything it could think of to destabilize or crash the system so that we could attempt to catch those cases and debug through them and then fix them. There were many people whose full-time job was entirely to devise new ways to abuse the operating system in the hopes of breaking it. These tests would run all night on every machine that we had, all while each was connected to a debugger. Any oddity would be investigated by the developer responsible for that particular area. They could connect to the machine's debugger remotely from anywhere, even from home, and that gave them the opportunity to inspect the issue effectively live. Into this mix, I added my assertion message that the CPU time was never greater than 100% in total. If it ever was, an alert message would pop up on the user's desktop, and if NT stress were running, it would stop right there in the debugger. And yet nothing ever happened. 
We could never catch it during stress, and the few times that it did happen live during interactive daily use were harder to catch. Since repro cases were so exceedingly rare, I got a little desperate and I did something unconventional. I put my home phone number in the assert message. If this ever happened to anyone in the company testing the product, I wanted to know about it right away, no matter what. And in the meantime, I moved back on to other issues and kind of forgot about the message. That was unfortunate, because it means I also forgot to remove it, and my home phone number, before we publicly shipped the Windows Beta far and wide around the world. It meant that every time the issue manifested itself to anyone, anywhere on the planet, my home phone number would be displayed to the user. Not smart. A few weeks later, we finally caught a case in the debugger on a machine at work. I debugged it far enough to convince myself that the problem truly had to be in the kernel, and then I handed the debugger connection off to them to investigate further. Sure enough, there was, in fact, a tiny accounting error somewhere in the kernel that happened very rarely that would push the reported CPU time over 100, and Task Manager had just been dutifully reporting that total. It wasn't my bug, and now it was fixed, both of which made me happy, and so I removed my home phone number from future versions of Windows. Thirty years later, I still have that same home phone number, and thankfully, nobody's ever called about it. I retired following Server 2003, but the people that have worked on Task Manager since have done an exemplary job of growing it while still maintaining the core attributes of reliability, responsiveness, and crisp painting that I instilled in the original, and I couldn't be happier with how it works and looks today. But still, it would be nice to know what files are locked by a particular process, or what process has locked a particular file, which just goes to show that there's always room for more features. And the only problem with that, of course, is size. The original task manager was literally under 100k, including all code and resources. It's now a dozen times larger at many megabytes, but such comparisons are a bit unfair because it does so much more than the original and now it's 64-bit. It's a delicate balance of load times and memory footprint versus features and functionality. One reason that it was important to maintain a small size is that task manager is a bit like the Highlander. There can be only one. or at least there should be only one instance of it running at any time. There are a number of different ways that you can launch Task Manager, so managing the single instance problem really has to be up to the program itself. So Task Manager does this by looking for another instance as soon as it starts. If it finds one, it sends a private message to the existing instance with a challenge code. The running instance must provide the correct response within 10 seconds. Stand by to copy Red message. Alpha. Standing by. Romeo, Oscar, November, Charlie, Tango, Tango, Lima, Alpha, Authentication. Any failure or unexpected results along the way and Task Manager will launch a new instance so that you're never, in theory, stuck without at least a usable Task Manager. Stand by to authenticate. I agree with authentication also, sir. Even if one becomes a zombie, another will be created to take its place. Your worst case, then, is having multiple Task Managers running. You can kill me, but two more will take my place! Then, I suppose if you were bored, you could have the two of them fight it out in a battle royale of process termination. You could even write rules and form teams and ultimately leagues, perhaps. Which gambit will you choose? Should you end the WoW task first or try to recursively terminate the shell? It's your move. Please be sure to invite me to your first gaming convention. And speaking of recursive termination, you'll notice that we always used non-violent imagery for Task Manager right from the beginning. You didn't kill a process or even terminate it, you simply ended things peacefully. That's not true behind the scenes in the code, however. That could lead to some very unfortunately named functions as time went by. My original function to end a process was named kill process using the same terminology as Unix had before me. Then, a few years later, someone was tasked with adding the ability to make that recursive, which they did. And, in updating the name, they replaced the word process with all children, giving us the rather disturbingly named kill all children function. It's all internal, however, and none of this ever made it past the sanitizing action of the compiler. Task Manager takes a number of other defensive steps so that it has the best shot at providing at least basic functionality that you would normally find on the processes page. For example, even though it's not the first page, it's created first. Then I check memory, and if I've gotten that far but memory is really low, as in under 8 megabytes, then you get a severely reduced Windows Task Manager with a much smaller memory footprint, but one that is still able to do the basic reporting and management. You should be able to get a Task Manager up and running with what today would be almost no free memory. Sometimes I took that ultra-conservative approach a little further than perhaps I needed to. In order to keep the footprint very small, I wanted to avoid linking in the compiler runtime libraries, as I was careful not to use any of the functions in the first place. 
Normally, you still need to do it in order to get the housekeeping functions such as static C++ object initialization, but I opted to implement all that work myself, according me the ability to not pull in the compiler runtimes at all. This kept the binary that much smaller, but it's a bit of an extreme and esoteric approach. One nice little touch owes its existence to a story I had heard. Apparently, the GPS had failed on a helicopter near Seattle, and so the pilot needed to know its current location in order to set his bearings on the map. They came upon a low-rise office complex, and so they hovered outside the window and quickly made up a little sign that said, Where are we? And the person inside the building furiously wrote up a sign of their own and held it up to the pilot, which read, You are in a helicopter. To the amazement of the passengers, the pilot then flew directly to the airport. When questioned how he'd suddenly know in which direction to fly, the pilot explained, When I saw an answer that technically correct, but totally unhelpful, I knew immediately we were outside Microsoft headquarters, and I knew my way from there. To address that sort of thing, Task Manager does some niceties such as massaging air codes to make them more useful to the user. To that end then, when a system API returned a less than useful code, such as invalid, to a response to an attempt to terminate or modify a process, I would massage that message into something at least a little more useful, such as, the operation is not permitted on this process. In the event it gets an air condition it doesn't recognize, it goes to some lengths to get the system to parse the air into a meaningful message, with the aim being that you never get a useless message like, Error, the operation completed successfully. In addition to the goals of small size and robustness, my most important personal goal was actually flicker-free painting and resizing. Although the operating system provided all of the tools necessary, before Task Manager, I can't think of another application with that many list columns and controls that could be arbitrarily resized live in all directions without flickering or flashing. It seems a minor thing until you've experienced it both ways. I went to some great lengths to avoid even a single instance of Flickr. The process list, for one, is a fairly complex affair that takes full advantage of most everything that the excellent system list view control has to offer. For example, if only a single cell of a single row has changed in the complete process view, only that tiny little rectangle is invalidated and repainted. In the initial incarnation of Task Manager, I didn't want any rubber baby buggy bumpers to protect the user from themselves. By that, I mean that I wanted the operating system itself to be the arbiter of what you were allowed to do or not do, not me in the form of added rules inside of Task Manager. If you wanted to terminate the whole shell or even a process like WinLog on itself that would cause the system to then blue screen immediately, by design, you could do it as long as you had the appropriate administrative system rights and credentials. You could also do things like mark a CPU-bound process as real-time priority and it effectively would hang the system if you wished. That led to some bad press, however, as a few smarmy computer journalists showed how you could, as super user with the correct rights, crash a Windows machine with Task Manager in a single click. Never mind that you could also delete the main hard drive partition as well, so it's kind of a silly point, but it made for bad PR. Thus, from that point on forward, Task Manager has had a few kid gloves to prevent you from doing anything too foolish to yourself, but I somewhat missed the days when it was a sharper blade. And to extend that metaphor a little further, Task Manager has always gone to great lengths to be as powerful as possible. For example, under normal circumstances, even the administrator cannot terminate a process in another user's logon session. Task Manager can do it, however, by first checking to see if you have the debug privilege on your account. If you do, you would be able to attach a debugger to that process and then force it to exit, so Task Manager does the work of enabling that privilege and terminating the process that way for you. There's no point in pretending you couldn't do it, so it just goes ahead and does it for you. Another idiosyncrasy of the code is that it contains a number of functions and controls named Dave. For example, there's Dave's frame window procedure, init Dave's controls, Dave's frame class, Dave's group class, and so on. This was not so much a doff of the cap to my own megalomania as a side effect of the code having started its life as a side project. These are all cases where the operating system provided a version of a control, such as a group box, but I superclassed it and customized its behavior. To distinguish my version from the system's original one, I simply added my name, Dave, as a prefix. It made sense when I was working alone on it, but I likely should have updated those names when we brought the code in-house. It was probably a priority three item in RAID, which is what we called our bug tracking database. New RAID multibug kills all the bugs that bug you. Dead. What often happens to trivial changes in the real world is that, being trivial, people procrastinate on them until they actually have spare time to work on trivial stuff. But by then, it's too late in the product cycle to accept even trivial changes that don't fix an important bug. And function naming is not an important bug. And so, sometimes trivial but harmless items never get fixed, and as a result, the Dave classes have persisted across the ages. 
Most people know how to start Task Manager. What they may not know is that there are at least 10 ways that you can start Task Manager, just in case. You can press Ctrl Alt Delete and then pick Task Manager from that menu, which is what a lot of people wind up doing. You can also press Windows X and pick it from the Power User menu. You can right click the taskbar and select it from there. You can launch it from the Start menu. You can bring up Start Run and type in Task Manager and that will launch one for you or you can enter that into a command window for the same result. You could even browse to taskmanager.exe in the System32 folder and double click on it to run it manually. You could also create a shortcut to Task Manager and launch the shortcut. My personal favorite, however, is the one I added in the Windows login process, since it's by definition always running if you're logged in. Simply press Control shift escape which will signal the Logon Manager to start a fresh Task Manager for you, even if everything else is bunged. This is also a handy shortcut if you're working in a VM because you don't then have to deal with the special Control alt delete key sequence being captured by the host. Trust me though, Control shift escape is the way the kids are all doing it now. Until they were updated sometimes around Windows 8, the graphs in Task Manager were state of the art. For 1995, that is. They've long since been updated after I retired and they look great again, and the new dark mode looked great as well. One feature that didn't last more than one version, however, was the seven segment LED style meters that I used for CPU and memory. Quaint at the time, perhaps, they were problematic to localize into other fonts or for right to left languages and so on, and so they were replaced with normal text by the time Windows XP was released. Task Manager has one final trick up its sleeve for resiliency. If for some reason it gets into a state where it's broken and doesn't know it, you can force Task Manager to do a factory reset by starting the program and then, before it has a chance to open its main window, holding down Control, Shift and Alt at the same time. It has to be pretty fast on today's hardware to get it that quickly, but if you can, you might just be the one trick that saves the day on a corrupted system. Speaking of Task Manager secrets, here's a few others. If all your title bars disappear and you just have a graph, double click any dead client space to switch back to normal mode. This no title bar mode that I added is a mode to follow the original NT clock, which was round where you could remove all the borders as well, but it confused more people than it ever helped, I'm quite sure. If a shell can't start something or is hung, try Task Manager. It has a mode where it will load without any references to the Shell32 DLL and allow you to start programs like CMD without the start menu. In fact, if it gets to the point that it can't start anything at all, it has a special code to invoke the command window as your last resort. Try this. Hold down the control key and click on the new task link. No matter what, you should get a raw CMD window with whatever credentials you had in Task Manager. You can find the binary for any executing process in the process table by right clicking and picking show file location. You can also search it online, but I don't know if they have that much useful information there yet. In terms of the UI, a lot of people don't seem to actually realize that you can add many additional information columns, remove others, and drag them around to reorder and so on. And thankfully, Task Manager will remember your sizing and layout the next time you launch it. I hope you've enjoyed today's insider look at Windows Task Manager. I'm not selling anything and I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please do be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.